Shall we pray? Pray along with me. Father, give me the spirit of wisdom and revelation that I might know you better. Lord, open the eyes of my heart that I might hold on to that hope, O Master, by which you have called me, that hope that is not vain. And in this difficult day, O Lord, help each one of us to walk in that hope. For in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Are you ready? Not to hear, but to obey. To hear is easy. Our God is a God who calls us to obedience. You believe that? We are going through some tough sessions on Sunday mornings. I'm trying by God's grace to lay the foundations. That when the storm comes, your house doesn't get washed away. And the foundations God set for the most powerful home, life you can build, are the Ten Commandments. There's no foundation stronger than that. We started this journey five months back, exactly five months back. We are, we are completing five months in this place. And he's been good to us. We started as a very small number and we have grown almost 400 persons in five months. We've been able to invest in his kingdom, in other ministries. We never thought when we began we would be. We've been able to literally put in tens and thousands into other ministries as a small church. It's him. Okay, it's him. And the word has gone out through the city, through the country, through the nations. And people have saved, from the word that has been preached from here, people have been saved as far as U.S., Hungary, I don't know where all. Okay, and I thank God. Okay, We don't have to be large, but we need to be effective. Okay, God has called us to be effective. A church doesn't have to be large to have a big impact. We need to be faithful to have an impact. And I know many of you have been faithful. Many of you have taken leave on times and gone out with the ministry team that goes through the week to the hospitals, to the juvenile homes, to the old age homes. So you've been part of God's hand. There was a great man of God who had come during the British days to India. He was a praying man. He was called the praying hide. So that's what he did hours on his knees. His ministry was just to pray. And during one of his sessions while he was praying, he sees a vision of Jesus Christ on the top of a hill with his hands clasped behind his back. And he's watching tens and thousands of souls coming and falling into hell. And he's looking at Jesus. And Jesus is not moving. His tears is flowing down his face. But he's not moving, he's not lifting his hands, he's not doing anything to stop these people from going to hell. So in agony, Hyde cries out and says, Lord, you are the Lord of compassion and mercy and love. Why are you not doing anything? And the Lord looks back at him and he walks away. But when he looks back, he gets the message in his spirit. The Lord says, the church left on earth are my hands and my legs if they don't do anything. I can't do anything. And we need to realize we are called not the head, we are called the body of Christ. We are called the body. And the body functions at the pleasure of the head. And we are called to listen to the head and do what he wants us to do in our lives. I know we have dreams. I know we have aspirations. Not necessarily they are bad. But there is a very powerful verse in the book of Acts written about David. It says, David fulfilled God's purpose in his generation. Amen? It's not that I fulfill my purpose 
or Vijay fulfills his purpose, or any of you fulfill your purpose, we fulfill his purpose in our generation. And sometimes or often in that fulfilling of that purpose, there will be terrible times in our lives. We will go through trials and testings. We will go through the fire and we will go through the water. Because it's a part of fulfilling his purpose. But there is he who promises. You will go through the fire but you will not be burned. You will go through the water but you will not be drowned. A God who has promised will never leave us and never forsake us. He will be with us and take us through. Amen. Past few weeks we've been looking at the commandments. We looked at honoring God. That is how it is central. Central. We begin with God first in our life. We begin with honoring God. The Ten Commands begins all with God. And we came to one, two, three, four. And we told we we focused two Sundays on Sabbath. And how you honor God is connected with how you keep your Sabbath, your rest. Not working on the day that He ordained you to take rest and be found in His presence, but trusting that I will enter into His rest and He will enable me because of that to fulfill all that I have to do through the week. And then when God has finished talking about His relationship with us and our relationship with Him, then He steps into the next one and He says, Honor your father and mother. And he says, To all of us who were children and all of us who are children, our relationship with God on earth begins with our attitude as little toddlers to our parents. It will determine whether we are going to honor God and obey Him. If we teach our children not to obey us when they are told, can expect when they grow, not to obey God when he tells them. So honoring God has children starts by honoring your parents. And then last two Sundays we looked at how we become honorable parents so that it's easy for these little ones to honor us. So in a Sunday school teacher was saying which commandment deals with the father and mother? So one little one piped Honor your father and mother. Okay, which commandment then deals with the brothers and sisters? And the little one said, Thou shall not kill. <laughs> but you know that's the truth. The next verse, the next commandment that comes is dealing with the rest of the family. Thou shall not kill. And sometimes it takes a little one to have that wisdom of God. Probably most adults miss it. But you look at the order in which God has put each of the commandments. They are connected. They are connected. And I find a even, even interesting connection in the Old Testament and the New Testament. The shortest words in the Old Testament is four words. Thou shall not kill. And the shortest word in the New Testament is Jesus wept. And I want to put it together and say he weeps when we kill. But let's get this right. Because the English translation is not correct. If you look at that commandment, the way it's used in Hebrew. In Hebrew it is thou shall not murder. It's not thou shall not kill. Because if you take it the way it's written in our English Bible, thou shall not kill, then it becomes very problematic for Christians. Because it's the God in the Bible who tells you to kill. Sometimes, for the sake of righteousness sake. He is the one who ordered all the kings to go out to battle and kill. He is the one who ordered Joshua to move into the land and to kill. Killing on behalf of a nation for the sake of righteousness. Or when a government executes a criminal, it's not murder. When God is talking about, he's talking about premeditated murder. That's what he's saying, thou shall not murder. So get it right, because so many people got confused and they have started pulling out from the army saying that we will not go out to fight. Down the centuries this battle has been there as a Christian, God has said, thou shall not kill, so I will not fight. That's not what he's talking about. When you go out for war, 
There is no premeditated murder taking place. There is, there is no hatred. There is no resentment. It's for a cause. And the cause has to be right. So you need to get this very clear. Then they will stretch it farther saying that because God has said thou shall not kill, all should be vegetarian. But it's the same God after the flood who said you can kill and eat. Okay. You need to balance scripture because you see there are so many doctrines floating around in the last days. So many of them. Which doesn't tally with the word of God. Which doesn't agree with the word of God. Here God is talking about murder. But more than that, He's talking about the value of life. The sanctity of life. When he's talking about thou shall not kill, don't focus on the killing. Focus on life. God is saying life is very valuable in his sight. And down the ages, everything that man has done in his carnality and the enemy has done is to make human life cheap. Human life not to be valued. Yet, in the Garden of Eden, scripture says, God made man in his image. And it says, God breathed his life into man. God attaches a premium on life. And it is based on that, he says, thou shalt not murder. You shall not. You have no authority to take life. It's God who gives. It's only he who can take it back. God is in the business of giving life and not taking it. That's why John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only son. For what? So that we may receive life. God is in the business of giving life. And you know what? All of us sitting in this room were once dead. That's why the sink is there. But he gave us life. We were all spiritually dead. And he gave us life. And the world is full of dead bodies walking. And he says, I have given you the commission not to take life, but to be partakers of life and pass that life alone. I want you to get this very clear, the difference between murder and killing. You need to understand the value of something is determined by the price you attach to it. We all have seen postage stamps. Okay, stamp. To read your letter, throw the cover away. But you know, suddenly you hear in the paper a rare postage stamp. And it says it was auctioned for a million dollars. And you'll be wondering, my gosh, it's also stamped like anything else. But why did it cost so much? Or you'll hear somebody's old clothing. Just it happened to be associated with some superstar. It goes for a few hundred thousand dollars, sometimes millions of dollars. Or a letter written by Lincoln or Gandhi is auctioned for millions. You know what? The value is determined by the price that is somebody is willing to pay for it. And the most valuable commodity on planet Earth, God says, is human life because of the price he was willing to pay for it. Next time you walk down on the roads and you see those old beggars sitting on the roadside, some of them mad, some of them half naked, look at the price God attached to them and then reevaluate your criteria. God says, the value of a human soul is equal to the life of my son. The value of a human soul is equal to my son. And that's how we need to look at life. Because unless we value life, we will not learn to honor one another. Commandment number six, five was about honoring your father and mother. Commandment number six is about honoring human life. It's about honoring one another. That's what commandment number six is all about. And you will see, God puts barriers. God puts restrictions. He talks about in the law about a premeditated murder and an accidental murder. And where it is accidental, there is forgiveness, there is mercy. Let's turn to Exodus 22. We'll look at a few places because you need to understand, okay, we are not under the law, but the principles are still the same. 
Verse 2. If the thief is found breaking in and he is struck so that he dies, there shall be no guilt for his bloodshed. If the sun has risen on him, there shall be guilt for his bloodshed. He should make full restitution. If he has nothing, then he should be sold for his theft. These, these are questions which Christians ask. What if happens if my house is robbed? Do I have the, or somebody attacks my family? Do I have the right to defend? And in that process, if I kill somebody, am I guilty of murder? God says, no, you are not. You are not guilty of murder. You are allowed to kill in self-defense. And you need to realize that in many parts of the world that is being changed today, if you kill in self-defense, you are in trouble. Where the criminal is protected and the victim is punished. But God's order was different. He says you are allowed to kill in self-defense. What about death by negligence? Let's turn to the book of Deuteronomy. That will come two books after Exodus, Deuteronomy 22. I want all the young people and the older ones to understand the principle from this word, especially young ones and the parents. Verse 8. When you build a new house, you get Deuteronomy 22 verse 8. When you build a new house, then you shall make a parapet for your roof that you may not bring guilt of bloodshed on your household if anyone falls from it. Did you ever read that verse before? God said the life that is within you, the life that is in your family is sacred in my sight. And when you build a house and you have a terrace and there the Jews go and sit in the terrace and talk, see that there is a parapet, there is a wall so that nobody falls by accident and die. Meaning God says, Death by negligence is not accepted. Young guys, when you drive, you wear a helmet because death by negligence is not accepted because God puts a premium on the life within you. Hello? When you drive, you drive carefully because God puts a premium on the life not only within you but also on the others who are driving on the roads. I know some of you young guys are very good. You can drive well, you can drive fast, you can go through the traffic, but there are a whole lot of people who are struggling on the roads, especially a whole lot of older ladies on their small little scooties who just want to reach home so that they can be home in time for the children. And you whiz along and they crash. And God says, I will hold you guilty. Because you haven't put boundaries. I'm telling of something that takes place on our road every day. This is not F1 racing for God's children. God's children are accountable. God's children are responsible. And they will drive. You may be very good because I'm talking from experience. Because I'm a guy who learned to drive very late in life. Very late in life. Because I grew up in a country which was all mountains. So I, didn't even, I don't know cycling even today. I can't even drive a scooter with gears even today. So I need a gearless vehicle. And I know how difficult for people like me is on the roads when the young ones whiz by and have their horns that sound like animals and dogs and all that. Okay. And you scare the wits out of you. And especially if you've got a small little kid sitting beside you or sitting behind you, you don't want to crash. And I'm talking to believers. Not only the life that is within you, you respect the life that is on the roads. And you drive carefully. You drive carefully. God says, I do not accept negligence. Those days they were not driving bikes and cars and all, okay? But he's saying, I have set boundaries. Because life is important in my sight. And as parents, God tells, the life that I gave you, the children are an inheritance from God. They are valuable in my sight. And I don't want to sow death in their lives because of your negligence. Because of your negligence. If you smoke in your house, 
Your children become passive smokers. It's easier for them to get in that habit later than for other children. If you drink in your house, I'm not saying therefore you should drink outside. <laughs> if you drink in your house, you are setting a model for them. You are setting a model for them. Where it will bring death into their lives because of your negligence. You need to understand the principle, the spirit behind the laws that are there. Because scripture says we don't go by the letter of the law, but by the spirit. And where the spirit is Lord, God says there is freedom, there is liberty. And we need to look at each one of them. What are that I am doing in my house that can bring death to my generations? What is that I am watching that can bring death to my children? What is that I'm putting into your minds which may be okay for me but it's not okay for them and therefore they follow me because I'm doing something and then I'm sowing seeds of death in their life. God says, let there be a war. Like that great American poet Robert Frost said, good walls are safe. They make good neighbors. It's for safety. Walls are for safety. The more boundaries, godly boundaries we set, we teach our children to be good neighbors with God and with one another. And the earlier we start, start setting these boundaries, it's better. And God is saying in the book of Deuteronomy, I do not accept death by negligence. And all of us are guilty of negligence. All of us. There's nobody who's, who is. And all of you young children who study in schools and colleges, you might be the only witness of God over there. And instead of being a witness and a testimony of the living God in those places, you are bring sowing death into the lives of your friends by your negligence to honor God and His ways in your institutions. That they see no difference at all. If God were to say, tell Divya, that you are my only letter people are going to read during those two years you spent in Iflo. What is the message they are getting? Because that's exactly what scripture says. He says you are epistles written by God, letters written by God. For many people in this world, they will never read the gospel according to Matthew, Mark, Luke or John. But everyone will read the gospel you represent. And you and I in the world where God has placed us are meant to be the good news. Not just a speaker of the good news. We are meant to be the good news. And he says do not bring death by negligence. Do not bring death by negligence. Turn with me to the book of Deuteronomy. Here we are there, 27. Turn with me to 27. Verse 18. Deuteronomy 27, verse 18. Cursed is the man who makes the blind wander away astray. Do you know for all of us who are eyes, spiritual eyes have been opened, we are the ones who see. And God has placed us in the midst of a whole lot of blind people. And He says, By your life, don't let the blind go astray. Don't let the blind go astray. And you need to realize that testings that you are facing in your workplace, the trials that you are facing in the, blind, in the workplace is planned by the enemy so that you will react in such a manner that the blind will go astray. Don't react. Don't react to the, to the snares of the enemy. Some of you may be in your family, the rest of the household is blind and you are the only one who can see. And God says, don't let the blind go astray. Don't let the blind go astray. They are blind. They can't see. So whatever they say, whatever they do, are the responses of a blind man. But he says, you can see. You know me. You know my commandments. You know that I will never leave you, nor forsake you. You don't react like them. Because you are the only light they see. The only testimony of the living God in your workplaces, in your homes. The testimony of the living God is becoming lesser and lesser in the world. You need to understand that. It's becoming lesser and lesser. Because people are not willing to stand up and be counted. They are not willing to stand up and be counted. And God is saying, I have placed you over there to be my testimony. 
You need to realize God has told us don't kill his testimony. Don't kill his testimony. By negligence, premeditated, whatever way, don't do it. David was a man who killed so many. Saul has killed his thousands, but David has killed his ten thousands. That's what the women cried out when David came into the city. The unction upon him to kill was there by God. He killed animals, he killed human beings. God did not say anything about it. God permitted him, but God held one murder against his name. He says, when it came to Uriah, you are a murderer. He says, when it came to Uriah, you are a murderer. Because you premeditated it. You planned it out. You were negligent that day. You were there on the, on the, on the roof of your house, but there was no boundary. The parapet had fallen off because you were there on the roof, but you did not walk by the boundaries I had set for you. And that led to murder. All the way into the new covenant and the, when the new covenant book, the book of Matthew begins, and when the generations of Jesus are recorded, it's still read there in all the things David did right, except when it came to Uriah. God has not Accept murder, negligent or premeditated. It's not acceptable. Sometimes we have to kill. We are asked to kill. Remember the Levites at the camp when the golden calf was made? It was God who told them to strap their swords onto the side and go and kill flesh and blood. Sometimes you have to kill. But you are not allowed to murder. Because when you murder, it is always for gain. And you need to realize that each one of us, there is lurking, there is hidden a murderer. In each one of us. This is incredible stories told about a judge. Justice Sanders of the California, one of those appeal courts. He was a man who had dealt with all kinds of people. He's a judge. Criminals and lawyers and politicians and everybody has dealt with all kinds of people. But one day when he came back home, he was in a very strange situation. His three-year-old daughter has been crying the whole day. Her name is Zoe. She's been crying because her pet turtle had died. She was heartbroken, inconsolable, in tears, sobbing, sobbing. The mother had been trying to handle her the whole day. It didn't help. Now the father has come. She said, okay, now you handle it. So he sat with her. He didn't know what to tell. He tried everything. I will get you another turtle, similar turtle. She said, no, it's not the same. Which is true. It's not the same. You can't pull kids. They know it's not the same. He tried everything. It didn't work. Then finally he said, let's have a funeral party. Now the three-year-old one did not know what a funeral was. She understood party. So he said, we will call all your friends. We will have balloons. We will have cake. We will have ice cream. We will have all these things. And the tears stopped. And we will bury your daughter. The tears stopped. And then something happened. When they looked down, the head came out of the turtle and the turtle starts moving. And out of the mouth of the three-year-old came, Father, let's kill it. You know what? There's a murderer lurking within each one of us. When we realize party time is over, my fun is going to be taken off, everyone is ready to kill that's one day when Justice Sanders realized, even in my own home, in the heart of a three-year-old, lurks a murderer. And that is something that God has spoken in the book of Genesis. If you are not born of God, then you are born of the enemy. And God says he was a murderer from the beginning. He was a murderer from the beginning. You need to realize the lie in the garden was not about power or authority. It was a lie because he wanted to kill the ones God loved. When they swallowed their lie, he killed them. Because this God had said, if you eat, you will die. The first murderer is the devil. The first murderer is the devil. And God is asking, count. How do you take decisions? If you see the cake and the ice cream of life moving away, what is the decision that you take? Are you willing to die? 
or are you willing to kill them? You hear so much from the media today that life has no value anymore. How is it possible that the media will go over and over and over and over and over about death that is happening about in some war they will call it unrighteous and unjustified and will keep silent about 3,000 babies that are killed every day in the state, United States alone. 30% of the babies that are conceived in America never see life. Runs into millions. Nobody speaks about it. Why? Nobody speaks about it. If God had put a small window in the tummy of a mother, would our response have been different? Because the world would have seen the baby yawning before the ninth week. Stretching and curling her fingers before the ninth week. But when we don't see and we don't want to accept it, and that the baby suddenly takes our cake and our ice cream away, then you can go to the most gruesome things which even Hitler did not do and kill that baby. An abortion takes place in some of the cases. You use something like a vacuum cleaner to suck the brains of the baby off. You don't want to talk about it. Did the media tell you that in the year 2006 alone, in spite of opposition from everybody, by one stroke of his pen, President Bush signed a bill which is banning partial birth abortion and saved in 2006 100,000 babies who are alive today? Did you ever hear that? No, because it doesn't suit the agenda of those who want to kill. Over 300, 400,000 children are today alive in the US because he signed a bill and saying that I am pro-life. I am not pro-choice. But you will not hear that. You will not hear that. Because we have put our rights over and above our responsibilities. This week, it's all about human rights. The 60th anniversary of the Human Rights Declaration. And I wish the church would come and say this is the 2000th anniversary of human responsibility. We are not willing to take responsibility. We are not willing to take responsibility. And if there is somebody here, this is not for condemnation, who has at some point in time because of pressure, some situation, had to go and abortion, there is no condemnation in the house of God. There is forgiveness. The three big people in the Bible are Moses. David and Paul. The two common things about them was both, all three loved God with all their heart and all three were murderers. Forgiven and redeemed. But we are talking about a principle. We are talking about an idea that devalues life. Devalues life. And it's not the, the woman who is guilty. The men are equally as guilty who take them to those abortion clinics. The society that puts so much pressure on them. If you had watched the news, the past few months of the American election, how much a woman was mocked in all the name light shows and everything. But she had the guts to stand up and say, my youngest son has got Down syndrome and I choose to have him. And her teenage daughter was pregnant and she chose to keep that baby. And help her daughter through. Because children make mistakes. Children make mistakes. Young people make mistakes. And it is the responsibility of the parents to say that what happened was a mistake. But no child is ever a mistake. There are only illegitimate parents. There are no illegitimate children. The current president-elect of U.S the most liberal pro-abortion president who has ever come into the White House. Yet, if he had been born at a time before abortion was made legal, he would have been alive because he was born out of wedlock. And his mother was only around 17 years old. You have to thank God for your own life that you were in abortion. When you stand up, you are able to 
science decrees saying that life is not. It's all about life. Entirely it comes down to life. And God is pro-life. He is not pro-choice. But if you make a pro-choice and then you come to Him, He still comforts you, He still helps you up to come over your head. It's all about life. It's not about your pocket. It's not about the economy. Economy never matters to God. Just never matters to God. He can make the rain shine on anybody. He can feed you in the midst of wilderness and He can give you a harvest in the time of famine. But when it comes to life, that is God's priority number one. That people will not talk about it. I am telling you that you have to stand up and talk in your generation. You may be mocked. You will be abused. You will be called names if you stand up in your, in your workplace. You need to say that I believe in a culture of life. Not in a culture of death. That is what is important to my God. Because a God who says, life comes from me. And God says, even before your mother, even before you are formed in your mother's womb, I knew you. Where does life begin? Does it begin at conception? It does begin at conception because he said so. He said, I knit you together in your mother's womb. But these are the issues our generation will face. Because we are getting more and more sophisticated. Now if you don't want a girl child, kill it. Keep on killing until the next fetus is male. You can get even more sophisticated. If you don't like black eyes, you can keep on killing until you get blue eyes. I'm talking about real things that happen. We want designer babies now. And everybody goes to court and fight for the right to kill. And the court sits there and adjudicates saying that you have the right to kill. If you take a line, the end, the two ends of the spectrum, one is abortion, the other is euthanasia. Both are the same. Both are the same. One says this child will create trouble for me, I want it dead. Saying that this, this is old and helpless, he's a burden to me, kill him. Both are the same ends of the same spectrum. One you deal with the old and the helpless, the other you deal with the unborn, innocent. Both are the same. Yet today so many countries have legislated that you can kill somebody who can't respond. Who can make a choice. And where do we stand? Where do we stand? We have to make our choices. We have to make our choices today, Lord. Because the day is coming when it will become prevalent all around the world. In the book of Genesis, before the flood in Noah's time, God said the earth is full of violence. And Jesus said, in the last days, it shall be the same. The earth is full of violence. Violence against those who can't defend themselves. And I don't understand all these rights activities. How can they not speak up for that one soul who cannot stand and speak for himself or herself, the baby in the womb? The most silenced voice on planet Earth is the unborn baby. They have no voice. They have nobody to speak. And if you speak for them, then you are labeled as a fundamentalist. And God says, will you stand up and speak for me? Because they don't want the children to come to him. They don't want him to give life so that they can come to him. What is our stand? God is asking, what is our stand? You know when this all began? It began long, long in the beginning, beginning of time. Beginning over there outside the Garden of Eden. It was a tough time. I sometimes speculate, how was the land then? Because the land had been cursed. When the curse is fresh, was the land all absolutely dry? Was working really difficult? What implements did Adam and Eve and Cain and Abel have? How did Cain as a farmer work? And I believe he must have really struggled. Not only did he have to farm, he also had to make the first farming tools. He had to learn what farming is because before that in the garden, everything was readily provided. Now he has to learn. He has worked hard. 
He has worked hard and now it is harvest time and harvest has come and after working so hard and he must have looked down on his brother because all he can see him is following a herd of sheep. And now it's offering time. Both of them come. He brings the work of his hands. The work of the sweat of his bro. He brings the offerings from his field. And his brother brings blood and meat. And scripture says, God looked at Abel and his offering. He looked at Cain and his offering. And he accepted Abel's offering. And something started to happen there. It's written, Cain was angry. We will deal with anger now. Because we feel I have been murdered. I am telling you we are wrong. Matthew chapter 5 will say that everyone is a murderer. And guilty or in danger of hellfire. That's where it starts. That's where it starts. Cain is angry. And God says, you are angry. And when you are angry, sin is crouching at your door. I don't believe the first murder Cain committed was with Abel. I believe it must have been the second or third or fourth murder. I believe the first things he killed must have been snakes. Because there was an enmity ordained in the garden between the seed of the snake and the seed of man. And I believe that out in the fields when he was plowing, there must have come out snakes. And the first thing was to take a rock and smash his head. Now he has learned the art of taking life. Now it comes to his brother. He knows how to kill. He knows how to take life. And scripture says it is deception, it is premeditated. He called his brother and says, let us go. Then he said, he killed him. He killed his brother. That's where the first murder takes place. We didn't have to wait long for murder to take place. You need to realize, by the second generation, murder had already taken place. And God is asking us today, are you angry? Are you angry? He's asking. If you're angry, he's asking. Why are you angry? Remember that question? He says, why are you angry? Because every time you are angry and you don't make your anger accountable, he says you are a potential murderer. And the blood of your brother cries out from the ground. And he calls out and says, Cain, Cain, where is your brother? Where is your brother? Deuteronomy 27, which we look, talks about secretly killing your neighbor. Have he killed? Secretly killed? Have you secretly murdered somebody's reputation? Everybody carries the most powerful weapon of murder within them. It's right there in their mouth. And God has given us 32 teeth to guard it and keep it inside. A fortress. The only organ in your body that is kept in a fortress is the tongue. Because God says it's a very murderous weapon. And we kill secretly using that. Are we accountable before God? God says, are we accountable? Because God says, thou shalt not kill. Turn with me to Matthew chapter 5. Verse 21 onwards. You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be guilty, will be in danger of judgment. 
But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and then remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother, and then and come and offer your gift. There are three stages that is mentioned over there. You know what? Under the new covenant, Jesus says, murder begins always in the heart. And under grace, we are not under law. Thank God we are not under law. Are you sure? Under law, you are judged only if you kill. Under grace, you are judged if you are angry. Because lots of people say, no, no, brother, don't quote the law to me because I am under grace. Thank God you are under grace because the, the demands are much more. The standard has been raised even higher under grace. And what does it say first? It says there, you have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. He says, you have heard the law, you have heard the Ten Commandments. He says, just told not to murder. But I am telling you under the new covenant, he says, don't even be angry. We look at the anatomy of murder today. First stage, God says, is raka. Whoever is angry with his brother, without cause, shall be in danger of judgment. He says, if you have a reason to be angry, let it better be a just reason. God is not saying, don't be angry. Anger also is an emotion given by God. But that anger should be just. It should be righteous. It should be reasonable. It should be according to God's word. Jesus also was angry. You know that Jesus was angry. Okay. But not without cause. And then it says, stage one. Whoever says to his brother, Raka shall be in danger of the council. The council, the Sanhedrin. Raka means empty-headed in Aramaic. He says that the first stage of anger, emotional. He says, if you are venting to emotional anger, then you better go for help to the council. You are accountable to the council. You need to go for help. He is suggesting to us today, if you are used to outburst, if you are an emotionally angry person, you need help. You better make yourself accountable to somebody. Don't hide it. Because... If you don't deal with anger at that stage, it will go to the next stage where you will call your brother Raka, the one who was made in the image of God and then God says, you are in danger of hellfire. Jesus is saying, along with the next commandment which we will do probably next week, he is saying that most people Most people, he says, would commit adultery if they were not had the fear they would get caught. In the same way, they would kill if they were not worried about the consequences. What happens if in 10 years time the culture of the world is that if you are angry, the government says you can kill. The government says you can kill. What will happen? And that is what bombarded to us day and night over the newspapers and media that killing is okay. Because you need to realize because of the information that has gone in from the other side, so many believing Christians today think that abortion is okay. They have changed the viewpoint. So many believe it is okay. So many believing Christians Especially in the West, think homosexuality is okay. God has no problems with that. How did it happen? How did what God say is an abomination become okay? How did it become okay? And God says that's the truth about each one of us. There is a murderer lurking within. And if we are not careful and take help and make ourselves accountable if you are an angry person, angry. You know why? Life came. I have worked so hard. And lots of people get angry in their workplace. 
That's why God says, when you work in your workplace, work unto me. So many people get angry in their marriages. So God says, husbands, love your wife like Christ Jesus. Meaning what? Expecting nothing. So that you don't get angry when she dumps you. Wives, submit your husband as unto the Lord. Meaning, as Jesus submitted to the Father. He got nothing from us. So that you won't be angry in your relationships. When there is a giving without expecting anything back, you are not leaving room for anger. Are you getting it? Otherwise you will, look, you will always look for somebody to pin the blame on. You are not willing to stand up and say, it could be my problem. You are always looking to find somebody to pin on. It was Cain's problem, but he looked and he thought, this is the guy who is responsible for taking my approval away. Yet God told him, if you do what right, won't he also be accepted? But he was not willing to do right. He looked at the other fellow who walked away. And his anger was now focused on the other person. And sometimes we deal with people who are so angry with somebody else. If only my wife was good and kind to me. He says, no, she doesn't have to. Because your peace and your joy comes from me, not from her. Husband gets so frustrated. She doesn't understand me. She doesn't have to. You got a God who understands you. We come in with unrealistic expectations into relationships and then get angry. God says, the only one who is supposed to fulfill all your expectations is me, not any other human being. And we get angry. And Cain got angry. When Cain got angry, what happened next? He moves into murder. And God says, deal with your anger now. Because if you don't deal with your anger, you will move to stage two, that is, you will start killing. How do you kill? You don't take a sword or a gun. But you start using your tongue and you will start cutting down your neighbor secretly. You start killing. That's what Deuteronomy 27 talks about. Killing, murdering your neighbor secretly. But when you kill, you face him face to face and say, I've got a problem with you. This is the problem. This is no private killing. It's a public encounter. Jesus' encounters were all public. It was no private encounter. Face to face. Because he is saying, I am not of him who is a murderer. I am of my father who says kill. And kill face to face. No secret to me. You need to realize that's the trap in which we are caught. When we are angry, we start murdering. Because God is given. That's what the, the book of James says in chapter 3. The most powerful weapon. The little tongue. The little tongue, he says. A massive ship, he says, is turned by a little rudder. A powerful war horse is held through by the little bit in his mouth. And he says, so is the tongue in your mouth. And you start venting your anger through that. And we don't realize. We move into the fool category. You fool. And God says you are already guilty of hellfire. Because God is asking us, heartbroken, the way he asked Cain, where is your brother? And when we are not able to deal with our anger, we are, we are all saying, I am not my brother's keeper. We think our answer is different. Our answer is not different. Our answer is still the same. We are still saying, I am not my brother's keeper. That's the first answer God got from Cain. It's a God who comes searching. It's a God who takes the first stand. He makes the first move even after we fall so there can be a reconciliation and a restoration. Adam, Adam, where are you? Adam, who told you? Adam, what have you done? Cain, why are you angry? And then after murder, Cain, where is your brother? And when Cain refused to deal with his action, after anger comes action, he walks away from the presence of God further and further away and he is a spiritual wanderer. I am telling you, 
all over the world in churches there are sitting people who are wanderers because they haven't dealt with their anger like i told you the best hiding place for christians is always the church you can never be found out here other than by the spirit of god but you are you are spiritual wanderers because you have never dealt with your anger you read the history of cain he went further each time he refuses to acknowledge god's question and find an answer to that he went further and further and further and further away from god and god is saying the blood of your brother abel cries out from the earth and god is saying how have you dealt have you dealt have you dealt with stage 1 have you taken help you need help there are people who have problem with anger you need help you need help because this is serious business this can lead you to eternal damnation you need help with god says keep away from an angry person angry angry all you know why people who are angry people who are angry are always focusing on right angry people are always focusing on right this is my view we are not people who focus on rights we are people who focus on responsibility only respond we are people who give away our rights john ashcroft was the attorney general of us in the first term of president bush a very strong committed believer once he was asked in a press conference you christians are also fundamentalists what is so different between you christian fundamentalists and the al qaeda but his answer was there is a great fundamental difference the difference is from the god we worship one god sends his sons to kill for in his name sake and my god sends us to die for his name sake he says there is a fundamental difference we are people called to die for the rights of others not to kill for our rights and often we kill for our rights destroy families destroy relationships because we are focusing on rights we break and we walk away and in the process there is life that is broken families that are broken if all husbands and wives were to focus on responsibilities instead of rights we would have families together and children would in die children would in die they are the ones who are caught in between but we are focusing on right it's my right to have this it's my right to have this god says it's your right to give up that because when jesus came he did not stand on right he did not stand on right he stood on responsibility If somebody could have stood on right it was he he stood up for his responsibility and god is asking us are we standing up are we standing up see that's that you need to realize everything is connected everything is connected the whole problem about evolution is it makes you look at life with contempt it looks at life with contempt i had a poem written yeah three monkeys sat in a coconut tree discussing things as they said to be said one to the other now listen you two there's a certain rumor that can't be true that man descends from our noble race that very idea is a disgrace no monkey ever deserted his spouse to leave her babies with others for a career no monkey builds a fence around a coconut tree so that the others can partake of it No monkey goes to your bar and drinks and kills just for the sake of it. It is true man has descended but not from us. You need to realize we do things which even monkeys don't do. And God is still asking us, where is your brother? The answer to the fifth question in the Bible is connected with the sixth commandment. Where is your brother? Where is your brother? The murderer Moses was able to answer that when he stood before God and God's judgment and says, "Lord, take my life. Don't kill the people." He was a murderer. 
Remember, he was a murderer. He stood there. He answered the question, Lord, my life saved him. And God's wrath passed over. Paul stood there in between. He was a murderer and says, Lord, kill me. That these people who persecute me, the Jews may be saved. Take my life. I wish it could be rewritten. My name off and their name written in the book of life. And the very son of God lay there on the cross. And he had the answer to the question, where is your brother? He says, there, brother, there are all my brothers sitting at me, mocking me, calling me names. And I love them, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Where is your brother? We are accountable. We are accountable. Turn with me to 1 John before we close. Chapter 3. Verse 11. For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another, not as Cain, who was of the wicked one. Did you hear that? And murdered his brother. Why did he murder him? Because his works were evil and his brothers righteous. We know. Do not marvel, my brethren, if the world hates you. We know that we have passed from death to life because we love the brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. And God is asking us today. We disagree on ideas. We disagree on ideologies. We disagree on issues. But if you hate, if you hate, if you hate, he says, his life is not there in us. He says his life is not there in us. You cannot call yourself to be a believer and still hate. And if you got a problem with anger, it needs to be dealt with. It needs to be, you need to make yourself accountable to somebody. Before it goes to this stage where judgment comes upon us. This is not a prosperity gospel. This is a healthy gospel. The health of your spirit comes first. Before, what's the point in having a healthy body and going to hell? So remember what Jesus said, it's better to go to hell, to heaven with one eye, than to go to hell with your whole body intact. We are dealing with serious issues over the week. Because God is looking for a church that will be whole and be complete. A church that will be able to stand the pressure of the last day. Because you are going to be bombarded day and night with information. Information that denies the truth and the word of God. And it's not going to happen, I keep telling you then. It's going to happen today by what you decide. You may have, some of you may have gone through tough relationship problems. But that doesn't give you an excuse to hate. That doesn't give you the excuse to vent out anger against whoever that spouse is, man or woman. You discuss issues. You look at the issues. But the person is still made in the image of God. However far removed he or she may be. And God says, life comes from me. And put boundaries. When you go onto the roof, see that there is a wall. When you drive on the road, see there is a wall. When you go into your colleges, young people, see that you are not leading the blind astray. I'm telling you, young people, I know you are caught up in all the latest modern things. You can handle it. You know why? Because you know God. But somebody who follows you who doesn't know it may not be able to handle it. May not be able to handle it. For you, it may be just an outward thing. But for him or her, it will become an inward thing. Nothing in modern day, 20th and 21st century, that is outward, is not related to the spirit. 
Everything, every fashion, every hairstyle, every clothing, everything that comes is connected with an age and a rebellion. You need to understand. You don't just dress. You go back and check what started that fashion. And you will be realize that behind that there was an ideology. You are free because you are born from above. But somebody who follows you may be entrapped forever. And God said, you led the blind astray. You led the blind astray. I put you as the light on the hilltop. But if the light within you is darkness, how great is the darkness? <coughs> the light God calls us to, as Don Bonhoeffer said, Christ Jesus bids every man to come to him and die. And then begins life. <coughs> the gospel that you preach is come, come and live and live my best life on earth my best life now best life is then not here, this is a life of sacrifice, this is a life of giving up so that we can gain not of accumulating so that you end up empty handed over there, there is a man in the bible called Lord Abraham's nephew he went searching for the good things of life and each time he took a step, he moved further and further and further away from God. And finally God had to pull him out of a city destined for destruction because of the intercession of his prayer, of his uncle. Look back and see the testimony, the witness not left behind. It's called Ammon and Moab. And God said, I spit on them, they are my wash basin. While his uncle left a testimony which is today still called Israel, God says, the apple of my eye, I made an everlasting covenant with them. One who went after the ways of the world, the one when that division, separation took place between Lot and Abraham, Abraham stood there and refused to look up until the voice of the Lord came. And God said, Abraham, lift up your eyes and look. But when Lot looked, he looked and he chose a land that was like Egypt. I'm telling you today, churches are picking up Egypt and bringing it into the church. They're supposed to keep Egypt out. A missionary team went into one of those powerful underground church those days in communist Russia or one of those churches in Czechoslovakia or one of them where absolutely praying godly people on fire. And this missionary team had gone from America to minister to them. And a whole lot of ladies in their latest costumes and cosmetics. And as they got into the church, the people ran out saying, the devil has come in. <laughs> because that is how they looked at them and said, And they came back and they were checked in the spirit, they were convicted in the spirit and they came back changed instead of changing the godly. What is the witness we have in the world? What is the testimony we have in the world? You hear a gospel all the time, it's a false gospel, it's telling you focus on the outside, focus on the outside, focus on the outside. It is a false gospel. The real gospel is of a stripping of the outside. The stripping of the outside. Finally he was stripped and put up on the cross, naked, so that life could come. You are saying, this is what I am. There is nothing double about me. There is nothing hidden about me. I walk the talk. This is me. Look at me, he says. There is nothing hidden. We don't walk the talk. We want the best of this and the blessings that come with. But we don't want the approval of God on our lives. We don't want the approval of God on our lives. And we are feeding a system, an entire system that is from the pits of hell. And pastors are so scared to talk because they feel the congregation will leave. They're so scared that the congregation will leave. So they start watering down the gospel. The watering down the gospel. Yet, there is in the midst of this dark days, do you know what? There is a revival that's happening in Europe. Did you hear that? Tens and thousands of young people are crying out and saying, we are sick of this. The system that is false and void, we are looking for something authentic and they are coming to Christ. 
a continent that had gone away from God after material things is now getting on their knees and slowly coming back and God is working a revival among the young. Don't believe the false one. There is only one gospel. There are no two gospels. And that gospel is all about sacrifice. It's about giving up so that others can get in. Others can get into the kingdom. And we don't become hindrances and blocks for these people to come in. If I need help here in the church, you know whom I have to trust? I have to trust Gokul, Hindu Brahmin convert, Moni, Hindu convert. How many Christians can I really bank on? You know why? They value their salvation. We don't. We have lived in the limelight for centuries. We don't value our salvation. Everywhere I have gone, I have seen in this 13 or 14 years of ministry, I can always bank on those who have come from darkness. Their commitment is there to God. Those who have come from Christian road, they have to run, push them, push them, push them. They don't need pushing. One touch, they are on fire for God. What about us? What about us? And then we take all these things from the West and we water down the gospel and try to put down their fire. No, brother, this is not the way to be. Christians are like this. And before you know, you can't recognize what has happened to you. The fire is gone. The boy who is pastoring my church, the underground church in Bhutan, was a drug addict. He was a Buddhist Sherpa. Today he is on fire for God. I can entrust an entire church into hands and never even bother. Just call up once a month what's happening. The church has grown bigger than this. He's a drug addict. And when I walk with him, he will show me. Sir, that is ganja, the growing wild. These are where I used to. But once he met Jesus, he never looked back. I'm telling you, a lot of young people, Christian people, working in secular places. What's your testimony? Is our testimony the testimony of our Hindi? The movies reflect the truth, you need to realize. Fact. If you look at Hindi movies, always the good and the doll was Christian names. Have you noticed all the Hindi movies of old days? The Don, the Gunda, not the big guy, that will be Hindu. His second in command who does the fighting is always Christian. And the one who dances on the bar is always a Christian with a big cross. Have you noticed? Where did they get the picture from? You think it's out of their head? They picked it from the world, they saw that the Christians were like that. They drank, they danced, they smoked and they said we are saved. And they put it in the pictures and the entire one billion people think that's what Christians are. That's our testimony. That's what they think we are. And that's what they see. In the villages, wherever you go. You know what? Christian Hindu kids have come and told me that you go to Brother James Bible study but Daddy and Mama have said don't become like them. Don't become like them. They used to send all their daughters, said, go, 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 listen. They teach good things, but don't behave like them in public. Still remain like us, conservative. We don't have to use even those terms, conservative, anymore. It's a bad sounding word. Once upon a time, conservative meant you were solid in your principles, solid in your faith. Today, it's a bad word. You can't use it anymore. What's happened? All these things man. And they will say, no brother, God looks at the heart, but man looks outside. Do you know that, what God himself said? When the sons of Jesse were being rejected, God told Samuel, God looks at the heart, man looks at the outside. But we are testifying to man. We are witnessing to man and he looks first at the package that is coming. And we need to realize that package has to be authentic. There has to be something consistent about us. We are not who are swayed by all the things that is happening. We are not people who spend our fortune on cosmetics and fashion. We are not people who spend our time spending millions on wardrobes to change as a new location, new something comes. We don't need that. We are people who invest in the lives and the souls of people in the kingdom of God. It doesn't matter. If you look 
I, I, when we come to the next commandment, I will tell you, young people, the only man or woman whose approval matters is your husband and your wife. You don't have to look good for anybody else. If he loves you the way you are, that is enough. Anyone who dresses and paints for somebody else got the other spirit in them. That's what the word of God says. You dress up only for your husband. You dress up only for your wife. That's enough. If she accepts you the way you are, he accepts you the way you are, that's enough. You don't need anybody's approval. And you will see that your money will remain in your pocket. You don't have to spend. You don't have to spend. You can leave an inheritance for your children instead of them using credit cards and then getting into debt. We don't need it. We don't need anybody's approval. But you look back and think about how much billions Christians are investing in things which God says will perish and not willing to invest in the lives and souls of others. When you preach that, you become very unpopular. Thank God I'm not in a popularity contest. Amen? But if you trust God and put your heart where your heart is and your money where your heart is, you will see even the things which you don't want comes your way. You don't have to worry. God is not a God who denies you. God is a God. First I want you to have my heart. Tough, disciplined life. Paul told Timothy, watch your life, watch your doctrine. And you will be able to save yourself and your hearers. He didn't tell Timothy, just watch your doctrine. You keep preaching and everybody will get saved. He said, watch your life, watch your doctrine. And you will save yourself and you will save your doctrine, your hearers. Amen? Shall we pray? Father, we thank you. We praise you, God. Because you are a God who loves us. A God who gave up everything for each one of us, a God. A God who allowed himself to be stripped naked and to be hung on a cross so that we could be covered by your righteousness and could come into your presence, a God. Because you loved us. And you are looking for a people. As 1 John 3.16 says, for a people who will lay down their lives for their brothers. That's what your word says in John 3.16 and 1 John 3.16. The God who loved and gave his son and the people of his son who lay down their lives for others, the master. So that, our oh Father, we can bring souls into your kingdom. Rescue souls from the pits of hell, O oh master. Get them into thy kingdom. Our focus is you and your kingdom, your heart, your name, your honor, your glory. That on earth you will be able to look down and say, there is my testimony, my living testimony in that place, in that college, in that school, in that church. A testimony of the living God, holy, righteous and exalted. Help us to live that, O oh Master. Help us to get our focus right, O oh Master. Not to be carried away by the things of this world. Because you said friendship with the world is enmity towards God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Let us teach us to be authentic, O oh Master. Authentic to your gospel. Like Paul was, Peter was, all your apostles, all your servants was, O Master. To be authentic. Not to follow mammon, but to follow the living God. To take up that cross, and to allow your yoke to be upon us, that we may have rest. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. We pray as we go into another week, may your presence go with us. We love you. We love you, Lord. Until the scales fall off, we will never truly see. Until all that sin that hinders our spirit are broken and fall away, we will know what true freedom is, O God. And I pray your word will continue to work in our life, stripping away like the peels of an onion, O Lord. Stripping away, stripping away every sin that hinders, every iniquity that binds, every transgression that raises itself. Ripping it away, O oh God, so that we can walk in true freedom of us. The freedom for which you died for us. Freedom to be truly the sons of God. Because your word says, as many as are led by the Spirit shall be called the sons of God. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord. Father, we praise you. We worship you. May your hand rest upon each one of us and our households. Through this week, through this month, until we meet again. Thank you, Father. For in Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Amen.